Hello and welcome to Unfiltered Career Talks with Margaret Boy. Today I'm very excited um, to have Alan Stein um, on this interview um, talking about how layoff decisions are made. Um, Alan and I met last year, a couple of years ago on, on LinkedIn. Um, we've actually done a one webinar um, today yeah. and I love Alan's work. That's why I'm super, super excited to have him here. Um, Alan is a CEO of Kadima Careers. Um, whose mission is to accelerate 1 million careers by um, 2040. I will let I, Alan talk to you about um, Kadima soon. Um, but prior to setting up his own business, Alan spent uh, almost three decades working for companies such as Google, American Express, um, Salesforce, um, Facebook. Um, and I'm also very, very excited about this topic because so many people have been laid off recently. Um, and I guess some of them are wondering, like, could I have done anything differently? So I am personally really excited to find out a little bit more about how these decisions are made. But before we start the topic, Alan, could you just tell us a little bit more about what's your background um, and, and a bit more about Kadima as well? Yeah, thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, you and I did meet on LinkedIn, where I meet all my good friends nowadays. Um, <laughs> and I just realized that I've been on LinkedIn for almost two decades myself. I joined in uh, uh, April of 2004. But a little bit about me, I spent nearly three decades working in the corporate world, working for equity research, uh, investment banks as an equity analyst. I worked in venture capital. I worked in baseball for a year. Then I went back to business school. And after business school, I worked at American Express for five and a half years, wasn't moving fast enough. And because of that, I decided to move into tech, worked in tech, leading customer success, operations teams, technical support teams at Google, then moved into a couple of startups. From the startups, I moved back to big tech because big tech pays more and treats people better generally, was at Facebook for a year and a half, then moved over to Tableau. Tableau got acquired by Salesforce. So that's where I spent my first 25-ish years of my career. Then in the fall of 2021, I left the corporate world and I decided to go all in on Kadima, where I help to accelerate careers by leveling the playing field by underrepresented and overrepresented by employees and employers between candidates and the interviewer. So that's a little bit about me and my background. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, with three kids, two dogs, and one unbelievably supportive wife. <laughs> Thank you so much for this introduction. And if you haven't heard of Alan, please check out his website. Um, Alan has a course called Kadima Job Acquisition Method. Um, it's a digital course for job seekers. I have never seen anything so amazing. It has so many amazing interviews, templates, scripts. Um, if I was, uh, I mean, there's just actually nothing better that I have seen on the market. So, um, so please go and check it out. But let's let's start with our topic. So, um, you've worked for big tech companies for a long time. I know you've you've had to fire some people, but you often were in the room when these decisions were being made. So, how do layoff decisions are, are made in the first place? Yeah, a uh, great question, Margaret. So layoff decisions occur. There's two primary buckets of how people can get fired. And I've been at companies where they've used different euphemisms for fire. Sometimes when I was at Salesforce, we called it reshaping. When I was at American Express, we called it displacing employees. Oh, but essentially, yeah. you're giving people the pink, the pink cart, the pink note or the pink. The pink slip, I think. The pink slip. Uh, that's the name of it. No one actually gets a pink slip, but I've been part of these conversations and companies don't call it firing. But when someone is asked to leave an organization before they want to leave, whether you call it firing, termination, layoff, whatever you want to call it, it's still quite disruptive for that individual. In those two scenarios, there are primarily two different paths that typically occur. One is individual very um, uh, ver very surgical in nature, where they may identify that, oh, Alan, you are a poor performer or you're not doing what we need you to do. We are going to put you on a performance plan and we are going to work on an exit plan for you. That is typically goes through a route called the PIP process, the performance improvement plan. Those are onesies, twosies usually. Some companies like Amazon have a more rigorous process around that where they aim to to, to wean about 6% of employees per year through the PIP process. Then what you're seeing now in a lot of press and headlines are what are called reductions in force or RIFs. These are mass layoffs 
where uh, Meta says that we're going to cut 11% of our staff or Salesforce is going to cut 10% of their staff or Google's going to cut 12,000 employees. Those are mass numbers where the companies actually communicate that to Wall Street, to the investors, and there it goes through a reduction in force process where there's more um, process in place to basically rip the bandit off very quickly in a buzzsaw sort of way. So whereas PIP is very surgical in nature, a, a riff is very buzzsaw or hacksaw in nature, and it is not very deliberate. Um, it's not very deliberate or well thought out in a lot of ways. So regarding the PIP, because I, I've been involved in some of these conversations as well, that I can understand. And I, I've seen situations when people were exited out of the organization. But what about people who are top performers? So even when you look at the news, right, even at, at Google, I, I think there the were all these posts that went viral of people who just were locked out at 3 a.m. Of, of the system, but they were actually top performers. So how are these decisions being made? That That is something that has always confused me. These organizations all have performance management systems. They all have ratings. Um, most of them do. Salesforce was a little loosey-goosey with it, but you all essentially had different sort of ratings where people got exceeds expectation, meets expectation, below expectation, or some other euphemism for that. So these companies give performance ratings on every quarter, every six month, every annual perspective, every annual um, uh, temp, uh, not template, like um, uh, uh, current, not currency, every um, in like a time period or over frequency, like they have certain frequencies that they give these performance reviews. And then they're choosing not necessarily to apply those performance ratings to decide the, the layoffs. Well, yeah. Some organizations are, but within the organization, it is being handled differently. So with Google, for instance, where they're laid off 12,000 people, there are some leaders that received an envelope and said, hey, we, you need to lay off 8% of your staff. Mm -hmm. And they may have chosen, okay, I'm going to choose my low performers. Someone else, another that leader. Sense. And that makes sense, right? Yeah. If you have to do that. Mm -hmm. An another leader may choose to reduce their most expensive people. Another leader may choose to reduce whoever came in most recently to the company. Another leader may just choose to say, hey, managers, you serve me up 6% or 8% of your staff of who you recommend that we lay off and we will lay off those. So the process has occurred differently across even within the companies, different leaders have handled it differently. And also some business units have been shut down. So if the business unit has been shut down, it could be any performer, high, low, medium, whatever. If you're part of a business unit, if you were part of Stadia Games with Google, where they decided we are no longer investing in these, these digital games, if you were part of Stadia, you were, your job was gone and you had X number of days to find something internally. If, if, however, you were part of the sales organization and the sales organization just said, hey, we got to cut 6%, then whoever's leading the sales organization, um, uh, then they had to decide, okay, how am I going to decide of my 40,000 people in the sales organization, which 2,400 I'm cutting or yeah. which 3,200 I'm cutting? And mm -hmm. they would come up with very different rationale for how to cut those people not a nice position to be in <laughs> it, it, it's not and, and and the part is and the challenge is these decisions are happening at very high levels yeah. and they're not involving the frontline managers and the yeah. frontline managers have a much better perspective of who is good and who is not good on their teams yeah. and so the decisions are being made up high with a lot of carnage down below with people that may or may not have deserved to have gotten cut. Absolutely. And I actually remember one situation. I kind of wish companies were honest about these decisions as well. So I remember, I'm not going to mention which company it was, but it was a big tech company many years ago. They wanted to get rid of a sales leader for a number of different reasons. And they've actually made up a reason of a change in strategy 
and they treated that as a as a layoff, as a redundancy oh, for, for in Europe. Totally, like <laughs> that actually was not the case. They just wanted to get rid of him. So totally, I've been in one of my companies. I'm not going to say the name. We wanted to get rid of a very expensive sales leader in our in an office in Germany, and they could not get rid of this person because German uh, oh, German laws, law and works councils. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So this company chose to shut down that whole office in Germany and said, we are no longer operating at that office in Germany. There were 30 people in that office. I was actually reached out by senior leadership because I had three people out of the 30 were on my team in that office. And I was asked, what do you want to do with these three people? And two of them, I was like, let's pay to relocate them. They're valuable. The other one, she's got to uh, relocate on her own dime because she was not one of my high performers. And that question was asked for me, and we came up with policies for people based on which ones we are going to relocate on this company's dime, and which ones we said, okay, you can still relocate, yeah. but you're responsible for all those costs. So we were kind of hoping that they chose not to relocate. And the whole and reason why these 30 people were disrupted is because there was one senior leader in wow, this office who was paid a lot of money and they've tried to get rid of him for so many years and it was such legal battle and such challenges we're like we're just going to shut down this whole office and impact 30 people that's very interesting and the and the, the other did you actually relocate them to the us with visas uh, the, so the those those three people that i had two yeah. of them relocated to other offices in germany oh i see okay. relocated them and the third one we wound up getting into some legal issues with. Um, okay. She was not too pleased. We wound up coming up with some settlement, but she was no longer at the company. Interesting. Okay, no, thank you for sharing. Any other stories actually of people that 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 either yeah. you know, you I, and I was called up on a weekend by like my leader, and kudos to my leader because some of these decisions are not inviting the frontline managers into it, and he might have just had the same policy for all three people on my team. I yeah. told him, well, two of these people are really valuable. Let's do what we can to keep these two. This other person, I never really understood what she did anyway. I inherited <laughs> her part of a reorg. Yeah. I just heard constant complaints about her. And I was like, if this gives us opportunity to get rid of this person, let's do it. So that would make sense. Um, any other examples of, because, you know, if someone is a low performer, I completely understand this might be a good opportunity to get rid of them. But have you had situations when... Someone actually was not a low performer. They were performing really well, yet they were laid off. And do you have any examples? Um, yes, I definitely do, because I have clients that are coming to me now that are part of that. So they've been part of organizations that were just cut to the bone. I've mm. had people that are really high performers and are new to the team. So they had no advocacy. So this person came to the team at, at Google. He was only at Google for like seven months or so. And they decided to cut some people in the privacy group and because he was the newest one in and there were like eight people eight pr product managers he had no advocacy from above they're mm. like oh, well i don't know this guy so let's get rid of him and he wasn't there long enough to have any sort of mm. reputation he was there like six or eight months or so by mm. the time the cut came yeah. um he had a he had a high salary because i helped him negotiate the high compensation but um, he was basically cut because no one knew who he was because he was only yeah. there for six or eight months. Yeah, and I think that's that. I've actually know quite a lot of people in the same situation. They were kind of like last one in, the first one to go. Yeah. And from what I understand, they were performing, but it's just the fact that yeah, they've only been there for a few months. Um, yeah. Yeah. So not. In fact, it's, it's quite interesting. Like when I accepted my contract in my current role, I was interviewing with quite well, a few of these companies that now laid loads of recruiters off. And I'm thinking, you know, who knows what would have happened? Because if I got the role, I actually withdrew from the processes when I got the offer because I just couldn't wait any longer. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it's maybe, you know, it's likely that maybe I would have been let go as well, purely because I was, you know, I would have been the last one, last one to come in um, during that time. But you just never know. So, yeah. you know, because this is actually so random in a way, right? Like you could be a top performer and you might be let go. Like what advice can you give to people? Like, is there anything at all that people can, employees can do to protect themselves? A couple of things. One, try to be part of companies that are profitable and growing. Granted, a lot of these cuts came from profitable and growing companies, but they overgrew. 
Um, secondly, try to be part of organizations or teams that are either driving revenue, yeah. reducing expenses, or have some sort of strategic value for the company. Um, third, make sure you're building advocacy and support for yourself from above. So not in, in all of these situations, leadership did not get to weigh in. But in the case where I was closing down that German office, I knew enough about my people. So I was able to save two and not save the other. Um, other things is remember that you are employed at will. And in most countries. In the U.S. In the US in, yes, yeah. most countries, yeah. most jurisdictions, but even abroad. Yeah. Like it's a little, it's a little harder to get rid of people, but now these layoffs are hitting the other markets. Like I just saw that Singapore just got hit from Google like a month or two later after they announced it in the US because they had to go through some process. Yeah. It's occurring also in Ireland. It takes longer to come yes. through there. It's but happened. they have to they have to fill out more paperwork. But yes. and outside of maybe Germany and France, which I think are really tough, like very good markets for the employee but very tough markets for the employer to get rid of people. Understand that you're, you are, your job is not, you're not entitled to your job. Yeah. You are working at the behest of the company, but on the flip side, you should own your career. You should always be looking. You should always be considering what else you can get because the company is not going to care so much about you when, when they are told that they need to reduce 8% of costs or 10% of costs you're not going to care if they ex Margaret or Alan or whoever. They can call you family. They can say, "Oh, we care about our employees all you all they want." Absolutely. When push comes to shove, it's a business. You're working for a business. So just like that, understand that you own your career. And yeah. if you're not watching out for your career and you're not looking for other opportunities, you are at the at the whim of the company. And you're seeing what's happening here. Like often, you'll be treated okay. But yeah. always, definitely not. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's a uh, people who kind of like keep updating their skills, who keep networking, who always have a you know not necessarily actively looking, but they on the lookout. They they um, on the lookout for what's out there. Who keep who keep the network. They find these jobs much easier and much quicker yeah. if they happen to be laid off. Whereas I can't tell you how many clients I've had who never did that. They spent five, ten, even more years in the same organization kind of just expected that they are safe and suddenly they lose the job and it's 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 really tragic for them because they just they don't even have that they're not even in that mindset of looking for a job so there's just so much i think you always need to be ready to look just in case abl um, always be looking yeah absolutely and so this is great advice for anyone but i think especially what if you're in a fully remote position because obviously since covid that has changed a lot I'm in a fully remote role right now and, you know, we hire people remotely. So some of them we've never seen before. How would you build that advocacy for yourself if you're working in a fully remote position? You know, you're not part of those meetings necessarily. Yes, you have access to your manager, but how, how would you how would you do that as, as a fully remote employee? That's a great question. So I, I think a lot of people enjoy being remote, but I think there's lots of value of being in person, too. Not that you need to be in person five days a week, not that you need to be in person every week of the month. But having that in person, those relationships are critical. And if you don't have the opportunity to do that on a regular basis, it's really critical to have virtual connections, virtual yes. opportunities. Like you and I have never met in person, but you and I have had lots of conversations over video chat. We've built up a nice relationship, a trusting relationship. So they can occur without being in the office. Although both of you and I, I would love to see you in London. I would love to ha have you here in New York for beers Absolutely. or whatever. Next time I'm in New York, I'm definitely yeah. letting you know in advance. <laughs> so, so there's definitely the benefit of the in-person, but without that in-person, you just have to try a little bit harder. You need to be a little bit more proactive. You're not going to have those serendipitous bump-ins, those encounters in the micro kitchen or over the cafeteria or at the water cooler or whatever. So you, you need to overcorrect for that because whether whether you like it or not, relationships are so critical to one's success Absolutely. and it's been like 24 out of my 29 jobs occurred because someone put in a kind word on my behalf mm -hmm. i still had to interview for most of those jobs yeah. but someone put in a kind word so they knew me in some Definitely. way not always in person but at least over a phone call or over zoom or something like that so more 
more than ever, because you're not going to have those chance encounters at the water cooler, you need to be a little bit more proactive of who you're reaching out to. You need to be a little strategic too of who's on your team and start to develop relationships with your team. Who is on ancillary cross-functional teams that you need to be building relationships with? Who is above you? And how do you get some face time with them? Because they're not going to see you in the cafeteria. They may not even understand who you are on on a virtual presentation. And build those relationships because whether it's virtual or in person, your net worth is your net worth or your network is your net worth. So invest in that network, build those relationships authentically, um, efficiently, and in a mutually beneficial way. Definitely. And even some, just just relating to what you said, even some basic things, like there was um, a different company that worked for prior to COVID, but we were working remotely two, three days a week. And I couldn't believe that some people wouldn't have their camera on during video calls. I know. Um, and How some people do those relationships, you know, how is it supposed to like for people to know of you if you're not even like showing up, if you're not ever contributing to the conversation. So I'm talking about like larger meetings. If it's if it's one to one, they you know need to have a video camera on. But sometimes there were like team meetings. Most people are on video, and then some people are not on video and they're not contributing. So I imagine if you're a manager, that person might be like the first one to go if they have to. Yeah, um, and, get and, and and that is so important. And I I forget what the number breakdown is, but I think with communication, I think the ratio is seven percent of communication are the words, and yes. about thirty eight percent are. Or like twenty eight percent are the verbal bodies, like the, the physical body signals. Fifty five, yeah. seven, and, and the rest, yeah. Yeah, it's like like I know it's only seven percent words, and then the other ninety three percent is a combination of body language yeah. and like and the tone of voice. So you can get the tone of voice without the camera on, but the body language, like seeing someone smile or look away or get bored. There's a lot of positive signals that people can get. And if you're working with your camera off, and I know some people are a little bit reclusive sometimes or consider themselves to be an introvert, but you're you're handicapping yourself by Absolutely. reducing that ability yeah. to develop that rapport and that relationship, which is critical for business, like relationships in general, business, personal or whatever, like people... Yeah. We're human beings and we do like to see and get those visual cues as well. I couldn't agree more. So Alan, you've shared so much amazing information with all of us. Um, thank you so much. So how can people find out more about you and the programs you offer? Thanks, Margaret. I appreciate that. Um, two ways. One, go to my website, kadimacareers.com. You'll see lots of great information. You'll see how I help coach people, uh, the digital course that uh, you, you alluded to Margaret and yeah, I help people amazing. negotiate for more money. And then I do post on LinkedIn a lot, um, at least once a day, sometimes yeah, more. You do have an amazing newsletter as well, everyone. So <laughs> yes, I have a newsletter too. And I have a YouTube channel. So I have a podcast. So lots of different places to find me. Um, but the two best places, if you go to our, our website, kadimacareers.com and, and it's K-A-D-I-M-A careers.com. And um, check me out on LinkedIn, Alan Stein. You can look me up, Alan Stein. Okay, awesome. Careers or Alan Stein, Google or Alan Stein. T-shirt, so I think, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I will share and, the link on the video. And, <laughs> yes, and I got lots of swag. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Alan. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, hope that you found it useful. Um, if you like this video, please feel free to share it and, and let me know what you've liked. And I will see you soon on another video. Bye for now. Thank, thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you.